Good morning. My name is Allison George. I am one of the organizers of this event. I am really excited to see all of your faces today. Before I say anything additional about the fourth annual National Maternal Health Innovation Symposium, I would like to welcome to this stage Susan Ninham. Susan will introduce herself in the Ojibwe language as she was taught by her elders. Susan is Ojibwe from the Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota. She is a longtime educator, a school administrator, as she told me this morning, a recovering uh, principal. Uh, she is a long time, sorry. Things just changed on my screen. She's here to open the symposium with an offering of the four sacred medicines, sage, cedar, sweet grass, and tobacco, and to offer words of thanksgiving and guidance in the Ojibwe language. I'm a little shorter than her. Buju and Dinoe Maganak. As a longtime educator, teacher, I'm going to teach you how to greet in Ojibwe this morning. So I just want everybody to say boo, boo. ju, ju. Boo, ju. boo ju. That's our, gre our formal greeting in our Ojibwe language. And before I start honoring our medicines, I want to talk a little bit about them. And the first medicine that we use in, in our smudge is uh, sage. In our language, it is called Bashkode Jibik. And this medicine is one that we can use by itself. But what, the way that I become to practice in honoring our medicines is that I use all four of them. And the second medicine that I use is uh, cedar, also in our language called gijik or gijikondaguns. And this medicine can be used in a smudge and also in um, a tea or in a bath. And this, the third one is our medicine that we refer to as the hair of Mother Earth. And it is the sweet grass or wean gush. And there's a story behind our braiding of the sweet grass that the first strand that we braid is in honor and memory of our ancestors. And the second braid, or the second strand in the braid, is used to honor the people who are here today, but also those seven teachings that have been passed down from generation to generation. And then the third strand is to honor our next seven generations to come. And then the last but not least, is our first medicine. And our first medicine comes from the branch of the red willow, the inner bark, and it's called in our language a pakosigan, but it's also uh, called a sema, which is our tobacco. And this medicine, as our first medicine, was given to us by the Creator to communicate with the creator when he went back to the creator's land for our thanksgiving and continued guidance as we live here upon mother earth and so those are our four medicines and i honor them by using them and saying giving thanks and asking for guidance in any time that I gather with others.
So the way that I was taught to honor our medicines that when we make a smudge, that there are four elements that we should have in our possession. And one is our feather, Miguan, our medicines, Mashkikiwag, our bowl, Jungade, and our prayers, Aname Ewen. Abuju and Dinaway Magarag, Ozawanakoduk, Indigu, Makwa Indude, Miss Gwagami was a guy gunning in Dunjaba, Gawi and Apaji and Nata and Ishinabe Mosi, Idash and Gwaja Tunji and Ishinabe Moyan, Miguich, Gichimanidu, Miguich, Adazu Kanag, Miguich, Okomesan, Miguich, Gokomesan, Miguich, Mishomesanan, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Wabanum, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Jawanum, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Ningabi Anum, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Gi Wadenum, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Ishkodang, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Nibing, Miguich, Manidu Gayajig, Nodenum, Miguich kichi manidu, daga widu kawashinang, indo dapinan, asema, mioma nungom. Miguich kichi manidu, daga widu kawashinang, indinawe maganag, minawa ekwewag, minawa ininiwag. We gi pi jayeg, mioma nungom. We indinandaman, National Maternal Health. Innovation Symposium. Miigwech gichimanidu. Miigwech bizindawayeg. Mahal miigwech majitada. So I'm just going to loosely translate um, for most of you who may not uh, know about our own tribal languages is that it's not a peer translation between our language and English. And so when I, the way that I was taught to give a thanksgiving when we gather together to do good things is that I give thanks to the four directions, give thanks to Mother Earth and all of the elements in Mother Earth, the wind, the air, and the water, and also to give thanks to everyone who's here to be a part of this wonderful gathering, and again, also to honor our medicines, but also to acknowledge that I don't know all of my language in a way that my ancestors did, just because of that um, break in the uh, transmittal of our language, because it's an oral uh, teaching. And so I apologize for that if I make a mistake when I speak. And just telling everyone, thank you for being here. That's it. Thank you all for listening to me. And let's get started. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, once again, welcome. I feel so much more grounded on this stage right now. My name is Allison George. You may have received multiple emails from me over the past couple of months. If you have not received them from me, you have received them from my colleague, Lynn Tompkins, who is hiding in the corner over there, or our other colleague, Laura April. We all, along with the rest of MHLIC, welcome you to this space today. The majority of this event is going to be educational, inspiring, and interesting because of you, not because of those of us who are welcoming you, you to the stage this morning. So thank you for being here. Um, I would like to start this meeting 
from our perspective with an acknowledgement. It is important that we start with an acknowledgement um, because Minnesota is the homeland of the Dakota people who have lived here for thousands of years. The Anishinaabe migrated later following the prophecy that led them to the place where the food grows on water, Naomi, or uh, wild rice. MHLIC recognizes that this land was stolen through broken treaties, forced removal, and violence. This is indigenous land and will always be indigenous land. Indigenous people are not relics of the past. We pay respect to all indigenous people, past and present, ancestors and descendants, who make Minnesota their homeland, contributing to the greater society as doctors, lawyers, educators, resource managers, engineers, political and community leaders, advocates, parents, and neighbors. We're also very pleased to have a number of uh, indigenous people as attendees and presenters at this conference, just as another reminder that many times people think of indigenous and native groups as something of the past, but they are very much part of our success and our community building today. Along with any sort of land acknowledgement, I think it's very important to have action to stand behind our words. Um, MHIC has several actions that we have taken and we are always open to more suggestions and building in this practice. But some of the things that I would like to point out that we have currently underway is on our website, we specifically curate and develop resources specific to maternal health in native communities. On the website, there are places you can suggest resources and we encourage you, please, as you know of more that we should share to do that. Additionally, we've provided travel scholarships during this symposium for any individuals who are presenting specifically on indigenous, black, or rural maternal health issues, since those are the populations that we know are most dramatically impacted by maternal mortality and morbidity in this country. Um, and we have several sessions focused specifically on indigenous maternal health. I do not have them written in my notes, but uh, I believe one is this afternoon. Tomorrow morning we'll be kicking off with an indigenous panel speaking specifically about various um, cultural approaches to maternal health since, as we know as well, indigenous does not refer to one culture. There are many, many different indigenous cultures and practices. Um, finally, I am very excited to point out that in your registration materials, you all received a cradle board pin like depicted here. The cradle board um, is a mechanism, a method of carrying children with you. Um, we ordered these specifically from a local indigenous owned business called Heartberry. Their website is on the screen. I encourage you to check them out. Um, and on their website, they explain that the cradle board is the original baby carrier. It comes from a time when children were a part of daily life and the family moved, worked, and thrived together. In most families, these are a prized piece of the family's art and handiwork. This design reminds us that we are always carrying forward the next generation, the future, and truly the next seven. Whether a gift from a family member, teacher, or local leaders, we all carry this future with us. So especially because there's a lot in your registration materials, I wanted to point out that all of you should have received one of these pins, and there's a little card in there about the artist who designed them. Uh, Heartberry, as a local organization, also sponsors workshops to promote the practice of uh, traditional arts. Um, they're a wonderful resource, so again, visit the website for that, if nothing else. And now we move into, if the slide advances, we move into logistics that I will talk about, but you won't see them on the screen. Um, housekeeping details that are all very important. The restrooms, perhaps the most important thing if you have been to breakfast this morning, are located in the hall directly behind me. Um, there is a men's and women's room, or there was, but we have relabeled the men's room a unisex bathroom because the general demographics of this population means that we need more bathrooms than just one. So uh, there's a dedicated women's room, there is a unisex restroom. We encourage nobody to use the urinals and to stick to the stalls. Um, 
Additionally, meals will be served in stars. So this morning breakfast was a buffet. Many folks ate in that area, which is great because we do have some seating nooks. However, this same room is duplicated on the opposite side of this floor. That is called the stars room, and we do have that set up in rounds for dining. So lunch, because of space, will once again be a buffet out here, but we encourage you to take your food and sit with your colleagues, make new friends. Um, registration, hopefully everyone saw it because it's hard to get off the escalator or elevators and not see it. If you are a speaker, we do have what's called a speaker ready table. This is where you can take your slides to AV and they can upload them and make sure that they're ready to go. Right now, the AV ready table is set up in Planets A, which is right outside this door. That'll be used later for a session, and the AV ready or the speaker ready table will be essentially with our AV folks here on the side of the room. So if you're a speaker and you're not sure if your slides are ready, or you have changed them, or you have any questions, AV will be in this side of the room or in Planets A to help you out with that. The goal of our symposium, this is the fourth year that we as the center have been hosting this symposium. This is the second year that we've managed to host it with an in-person component. All of you know why that is. So this is the second time we've been in person and our goal for this event is to become a trusted, evidence-driven and community-centered space for maternal health professionals and others invested in the well-being of families to connect, recharge, and advance maternal health equity in the communities in which we live and work. That's a lot of words, but essentially we hope to become a place where you can come together with colleagues working on issues of maternal health, uh, both network, but also just recharge and realize that although many of you come from different corners of this country, you are not alone in the work that you're doing. There are other folks with the exact same questions. There are other folks who wake up wondering if they're doing it right or what they're doing or why they're doing it, I'm very happy to have you together to say the work you do is important and we hope that you can recognize through this event that you're not alone, you're doing wonderful work, you are the reason that this event happens and you're the reason that slowly but surely we're getting better in terms of how we treat pregnant and birthing people in this country. We have a couple of elements that we have intentionally built into this event um, in order to promote the building of community and working together. One of them is that this year we have a code of conduct. It's been printed in your programs that were in your folders, that are in your bags. Um, it can be summed up as be present and participate. Act with respect towards one another and the venue staff. Honor and use correct pronouns. We do have pronoun stickers at registration if you would like them. Pursue curiosity over criticism, by which we mean ask for clarifications if someone's words feel offensive or ill-informed. Um, and this is partially because I am really excited by the diversity that we have in our audience. It is building every year, but it also means that all of us have had different experiences. We identify differently. We haven't necessarily been exposed to certain ideas, and sometimes they can make us feel challenged on the spot. Um, depending upon how much water or caffeine or food I have had, I am a little more sensitive than other times. So we encourage you if something gets very loud, if something lands wrong, to ask, maybe what, what did you intend? Like, what, what is going on here? Um, However, and we ask that you're accountable for when you misspeak or when you don't understand something, we recognize that sometimes it is really helpful to have an external mediator help you with these conversations, that these can be rough. Um, and so this year we are excited to have an ombuds on staff and present. Um, we have her con or contact information for Jen Sims, the ombuds, and myself on this slide. It's also in your program. Um, and I am going to invite our ombuds, Jen, to come up here and tell us a little bit more about how she can help us out in this event.
Good morning, you all. I'm happy to be here um, in beautiful Minneapolis. Um, I grew up not too far away in Chicago, but somehow didn't spend a lot of time in the city, so I'm excited to hopefully get a chance to explore. But before all that, I am honored to be asked to kind of help with any kind of issues or concerns that might come up during the conference. Um, and I, I think it said mediation we can do if that's something we need or a lot more often what I end up doing is just coaching people on how to deal with the situation themselves. But it's really up to whoever comes to me and we can talk about how we handle it from there. Um, I will say that my services are confidential unless um, it is asked that I share something with somebody else. I won't do that. So, and that's to create a safe space for people to come forward with whatever issue um, might occur. And um, I think you have my phone number and my email. And then on the Bova app, I'm on there too. So you got lots of ways to contact me. Um, and I think I will be sharing the, the lactation room when that isn't in use. Um, I'll be kind of in that area or kind of circulating around, maybe attending some of the conferences and uh, learning from y'all. So thank you very much. Which is a fantastic reminder. If you would like a private space, if you are breastfeeding and need a lactation space, we do have a room set aside for that. It is also on the hallway behind me, but just speak to anyone at registration and we can make sure that is set up and that the door locks when you're in there because that is a very important part of uh, privacy. In addition to having Jen Sims with us this year, some of you who, were, who joined us last year know Sunny, who is our graphic recording illustrator. Sunny is sitting right over there waving at us. She is an amazing artist and will be capturing all of the plenary activities that happen in here. And she will be visiting other presentations throughout the day. Um, Sunny joins us from Sea in Colors, which is an amazing organization available for other events too. So check in with Sunny if you want to know more about what she does um, or hire her for a future event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dorothy Salenti, who is the director of the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to Allison and her team, who's done such a great job uh, convening and getting us in this place. Um, and we just love the 50th window floor. Um, that's extra special. And um, thank you to Susan, who drove 280 miles um, from the Canadian border, 100 miles from the Canadian border, to be here. Wouldn't we have all loved to have Susan as our principal? Yes. <laughs> and I actually have sweetgrass in my home. When I um, went to my new home, a friend of mine gave me um, a piece of sweetgrass, and now I know a lot more about it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and thank you, of course, to Jen. Um, this was something that we decided to do after our last conference last year, and um, I know that she will be a great resource for you um, should you need to talk with her. Um, it's great to see old friends. How many of you came to the conference last year? Just raise your hand. Oh, so lots of you, this is your first time. So we're looking forward to making new friends too. Um, we know many of you have been doing this work for a very long time and are probably well connected to each other, but we do hope that you'll take the time to get to meet some new people and make new friends. Um, Thank you again for coming. We couldn't do this without you. And um, to borrow um, a slogan from Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, Rose, um, who's one of our very special partners, we are the people that we've been waiting for. So thank you for showing up and doing this important work. Um, so on behalf of our entire maternal health uh, learning and innovation team, I wanted to uh, welcome you. We want you to learn, of course, but we want you to have fun. We want you to recharge. We hope that you'll leave feeling like you filled your cup um, and are ready to continue to the important work. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center for those of you who may not be familiar with what we do. 
we do use the acronym MHLIC um, because we um, are trying not to use MLIC. We went back and forth about that and wanted to um, use something that wasn't quite as guttural. So we are the MHLIC and we are a collaborative of organizations. Our hub is at uh, UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Um, I um, have been in North Carolina most of my adult life. I grew up in New York. Um, I'm a recovering local health director, so I get the recovering principal, <laughs> um, but have been at the university for this second phase of my career. And so we, um, when we had the opportunity to compete for funds for the center, we pulled in a lot of different partners. So while we provide the infrastructure and the administrative support, we really couldn't do the work without all of our partners and colleagues. Um, we, our purpose is to connect the maternal health learners with the maternal health doers and to share best practices through our resource center and through convenings like this so that we can continue to improve maternal health, particularly for those that are disproportionately impacted by poor outcomes. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our training center, our resource center, and our maternalhealthlearning.org website. Um, just to orient you to what we do. So we need to acknowledge our funders. Um, our center is funded through a cooperative agreement, so everything we do is in collaboration with our federal partners. Um, and we um, recognize that the things that we say here um, may not be representative of the federal positions on certain issues. Our why is to support the collaboration and learning of um, many of uh, the audiences represented here, but also specifically for uh, those that are funded to improve their maternal health systems through the Maternal Health Innovation Program and the Our Moms Program. Um, and we do this by accelerating what we know works, learning and innovating new ways to address issues, and um, using engagement, innovation, and policy to advance and improve maternal health outcomes. We center equity and the, ex and the expertise of people who live in the communities that we serve. And we, we do highlight policy changes at the systems level um, in order to dismantle structural racism and inequitable access to high quality, respectful care. So that is very much um, our goal point in terms of our work. As I said, we have many partners that contribute to this work. Um, we partner with AMCHIP, uh, Race for Equity, Public Health Solutions, ROSE, Georgia Health Policy Center, and ACOG um, in a formal way through sub-agreements, and then we partner with many of you um, to advance our work. And as I said, we want to um, make new partners, and we also would like to uh, recognize all of you who are contributing to this symposium. So if you are presenting, um, would you please stand if you have a session here, if you're able to stand. Thank you so much. You really make this symposium happen, and we couldn't do this work without you. So your partnership matters to us, um, and in partnering with organizations and people from communities, we are able to continue applying what we know works and supporting the grassroots efforts um, by engaging directly with those communities. And we hope that someday we won't be talking about maternal mortality and morbidity, that it'll be something that um, we know people are able to achieve you know, joyful birthing experiences and positive birth outcomes, no matter where they live or who they are. <laughs> so as I said, we um, seek to engage others and, can, and provide spaces for convening and collaboration. Um, we are all about innovation. Um, as I said, we support many states that are working to implement innovations to improve their maternal health systems. And then we serve as a repository of resources. So if you go to our website, you will see many resources that we are either developing or that we are sharing on behalf of others who have developed these resources. Um, we always want to attribute um, the uh, work to those organizations. And as Allison mentioned, there's a way where you can submit resources that you want others to know about. Um, we, our resource center is organized based on topics. And so if you 
go to the uh, resource center and you um, type in what you're looking for, you will get a number of different resources that you might be able to use in your communities. If you'd like to submit a resource, you can do that as well through this um, link, and we will make that available to others. Um, in particular, we're um, excited that our practical playbook, uh, What Works in Maternal Health, will be uh, released um, by Oxford University Press in the fall. Um, and in there, you'll find that we've um, combined and collected stories and best practices um, in collaboration with over 100 authors across the country who are doing this work. So we hope that you'll keep an eye out for our playbook. So with that, um, again, I hope that you have a great conference. And I'm happy to introduce our federal partners. Our first presenter is actually joining us virtually, uh, Laura Cavanaugh, who's a Deputy Associate Administrator of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Um, and then she will be followed by um, Kimberly Sherman, who's Chief of the Maternal Women's Health Branch, Division of Healthy Start and Perinatal Services, and Lee Wilson, Director, Division of Healthy Start and Perinatal Services. So thank you very much. I look forward to meeting lots of you over the next two days. Such a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Laura Cavanaugh, and I'm the Deputy Associate Administrator of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau here at the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss how HRSA is addressing maternal health by increasing access to care and services, implementing high quality innovative programs, and strengthening the workforce. HRSA programs support healthcare for the nation's highest need communities. We serve people who are geographically isolated and economically or medically vulnerable. Our work in maternal health is driven by a simple notion, no woman should die from pregnancy or giving birth. Yet in this country, far too many families experience that loss every year. To meet and address these and other challenges, we're using the framework Accelerate Upstream Together. First, MCHB continues to accelerate the pace of change. It isn't acceptable that approximately four out of every five pregnancy-related deaths in the United States are preventable, which underscores the urgent need for action. Additionally, thousands of women experience severe maternal morbidity, which results in significant short and long-term consequences to a woman's health. There are also striking disparities in maternal health outcomes. Black and American Indian and Alaska Native women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than their white, Asian, and Hispanic counterparts. Everyone should have the opportunity to live a long, healthy life, regardless of their income, education, where they live, or racial and ethnic background. We must do more to accelerate progress. And we have to continue to innovate, to build upon the existing evidence base, accelerate our pace of change, to save maternal and child health lives. Next is upstream. MCHB continues to look upstream to take a life force approach to improving maternal health. Our investments support mothers, children, and families during each stage of life, from infancy through adulthood. We're thinking about women's health across the lifespan and not focused solely during pregnancy and delivery. This includes how we address social and structural determinants of health to create healthy environments that support the health and well-being of infants, children, and adolescents at every age. By reducing risk factors and increasing health promotion factors, we can improve health across generations. And finally, while HRSA has substantial investments in maternal health, no single agency or organization can solve this problem alone. MCHB will continue to collaborate with other federal partners, with state and local governments, and community and national organizations like the Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center and many of you in our audience today. We're also committed to seeking out and including the voices of women as we strive to advance equity and improve their health and well-being. In the President's fiscal year 24 budget, it provides $1.9 billion for HRSA's maternal and child health programs within the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. With this federal funding, HRSA plans to directly address maternal health disparities through a variety of programs, including Healthy Start, 
the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program, the Maternal and Child Health Title V Block Grant, the State Maternal Health Innovation Program, and the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline, and the Integrated Maternal Health Services Demonstration, and a variety of other programs as well. We also work in concert with partners across the government to support the goals outlined in the Biden-Harris administration's blueprint for addressing the maternal health crisis, which was reduced, released last June. I'd like to take just a few minutes to share some recent highlights from the Maternal Mental Health Hotline and from the state maternal health innovation programs and show their impact on mothers, children, and families across the country. First, beyond supporting access to physical health care and services for pregnant women and mothers, MCHB also supports programs that expand access to maternal mental health. This is particularly important given that data show that mental health conditions can be one of the leading underlying causes of pregnancy-related deaths. In, on Mother's Day last year in 2022, we launched the National Maternal Mental Health Hotline to increase access to mental health supports for pregnant and postpartum women and their families. This confidential 24-7 toll-free hotline for expecting and new moms ex experiencing mental health challenges to get the help they need when they need it. When a person calls or texts, they can connect with a certified or licensed mental health counselor. Please visit the MCHB website or you can scan the QR code on your screen to learn more about the hotline. Promotional materials about the hotline are available free of charge on the website. Next, I'd like to share a, a few uh, metrics from the hotline. In its first 12 months of service, the hotline has responded to over 13,000 contacts from pregnant and postpartum people and their loved ones. About 70% of the contacts, contacts were by phone and 30 were by text. The average speed to answer was below 30 seconds, about 23 seconds for the telephone calls and 16 seconds for texts. Most people, about 76%, are calling for themselves and about 5% are calling on behalf of someone else such as a family member or a friend. 5% said they were providers contacting on behalf of a client. And among the people who said they were calling for themselves, we have additional data from about 57% of them. More, far more are reaching out in the postpartum period versus those who are pregnant. And here are the top reasons for calling the maternal mental health hotline. They might call for more than one of these reasons. The top five reasons are they are calling are due to depression, anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, issues related to pregnancy, and relationship conflict. Because some people call for more than one reason, these percentages add up to more than 100. Next, I want to share some updates from the State Maternal Health Innovation Program, also known as State MHI. MCHB proudly supports state-led, data-driven initiatives through this program. With these awards, states establish maternal health task forces, improve the collection and use of their state-level data on maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity, and identify innovative solutions based on the unique drivers of their state's poor maternal health outcomes. Through the state MHI program, MCHB currently supports 18 awardees in the states highlighted in gold here. In fiscal year 23, MCHB plans to award up to 23 more states. State grantees are in the process of developing and implementing innovative programs aimed at the unique needs of their own communities. And I'd like to share a few examples from our 20, uh, fiscal year 19 and 22 cohorts. The Alabama MHI team is developing a comprehensive training for law enforcement and first responders on the physiology of substance use in pregnancy and mental health disorders that can mimic substance use disorders. The Arkansas program, known as the Perinatal Improvement of Outcomes and Safety for Everyone, or Primrose Project, named after the state flower, is establishing systems for reporting AIM program data and trainings to support hospital quality improvement. The Illinois Maternal and Child Health Digital Storytelling Project is a collection of 10 digital stories that elevate the voices of those who've experienced complications and challenges during pregnancy, birth, and or during the postpartum period. And the Montana Obstetrics and Maternal Support or MOMS project is providing birth simulation training 
for providers at non-birthing hospitals in rural and frontier parts of the state. So far, the program has trained over 150 providers at critical access hospitals in 18 participating facilities in eastern Montana. Simulation trainings have covered normal delivery and other events such as postpartum hemorrhage and preeclampsia. These are just a few of the tremendous efforts and innovative projects that MHI grantees are implementing to improve maternal and infant health across the United States. Thank you to each of you who are maternal and health improvement grantees for your effort and your commitment to MCH populations. I want to close by saying thank you so much to each of you, those of you who are MCHB grantees and our partners, for your dedication to improving maternal health. HRSA is making significant contributions to government-wide efforts to reduce and prevent maternal mortality and serious maternal morbidity in the U.S., but we wouldn't be able to do this work without all of you. We so greatly appreciate your partnership. Through our programs and in collaboration with partners, we hope to make the United States one of the safest countries in the world to give birth. Thank you so much. Good morning, folks. <clears throat> I'm not Kimberly Sherman, although I play her on TV. Um, there's a, there was a little confusion in the uh, uh, ordering of the agenda this morning. My name is Lee Wilson. I'm the director of the Division of Healthy, State, Healthy Start and Perinatal Services. And I am very, very happy and honored and pleased to be here with all of you to uh, uh, enjoy and learn at this um, MHLIC meeting um, here on the 50th floor in Minnesota. Actually, I forgot one. As I said, I'm happy to be here um, and enjoy this meeting. Um, and I wanted to give a brief land acknowledgement here since we do have some of our indigenous brothers and sisters here. And um, one of the topics of this meeting is um, indigenous uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. And we are here on the land of Minnesota Mikose people, um, the homeland of the Dakota people. Um, the Dakota lived here for many thousands of years, and we acknowledge that we are on land um, that was uh, originally theirs. The Ashinaabe people also reside here. And an interesting fact is they moved here frequently, somewhat nomadically, because of the rice. Um, we were given some of Minnesota's rice on our last meeting here when we were uh, working with uh, one of the tribes just outside of Minnesota. And I want to tell you that it's very tasty. It is also very dense, and when we were going through the metal detectors at the airport, we got screened and pulled over because of the rice. Um, so now we know one of the reasons why they're such hardy people. Um, anyway, back to uh, my, my shtick is over. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, we are very excited to have the opportunity to do these gatherings now in the after times after COVID. Um, I listened to Kai Rizdahl on uh, Marketplace on NPR uh, uh, most days, and he uh, has started referring to the before times and the after times from COVID. And uh, the world is a little bit different, and um, we want to acknowledge the fact that it is good for us to be in person with each other, that there are many things that we experience um, by being in the room, sharing, um, engaging with people. And I know personally that I am a happier individual when I'm around other people than when I'm locked in my office at my home. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've all taken the time to do it in person. And I want to encourage you to do this. Where we have resources in the maternal health space, and we are fortunate to be flush with resources these last few years, um, let's take the time and not feel like we need to live on a threadbare shoestring uh, or whatever the analogy is uh, you want to use to um, to get our work done that it is important for us to meet, engage, uh, recharge from the taxing work that we do and um, to learn from each other. Um, I am mostly here to welcome you as the director of the division that has seen tremendous, tremendous growth over the last three or four years, in particular in the maternal, um, maternal morbidity and mortality space. And I want to emphasize the uh, morbidity aspect of this because as Laura, my boss, said, um, this is more than just about mortality. And I've said at many, many conferences, 
uh, the marker of a successful pregnancy is not the measure of whether mommy died or didn't die. It is also not the measure of whether baby lived or died. And so we are about more than just the 700 to 1,200 women who die um, either around pregnancy or one year after pregnancy, but those women who experience the um, harmful effects that can occur as a result of pregnancy and the result, and those are the results of many factors that we here uh, working with Maternal Health Innovations are trying to address and resolve. So I want to thank you and congratulate you for the hard work, for accepting the challenge that we have provided to those of you who are here from the MHI program, um, and to encourage you to move forward. We are in the midst of a competition for new MHI funding. And I know that some of you are sort of sitting on pins and needles as to who's going to get the funding and who's going to not get the funding. I can assure you that um, that we are doing our very best. You were thinking that I was going to assure you that you're all going to get money. Um, that I can assure you that we are doing our very best to try to reach as many grantees as we can, many applicants as we can, um, and to try to make sure that those programs that we are funding promise to be successful. Um, before I go into too many details, I just want to thank um, the UNC folks, Dorothy, Sarah, and others who are in the room. Uh, would you stand just so folks can see you and know who, um, who the people uh, are that worked so very hard to make this, uh, to pull this meeting together? Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we have experienced tremendous growth from a couple million dollars in our maternal health portfolio in the Division of Healthy Start and Perinatal Services to now being about one third of the budget. Um, depending on what we get in the 2024 budget, we're looking at somewhere between 60 and $80 million a year for just in our maternal health line. So that is a tremendous um, growth, uh, tremendous expansion. And so I'm gonna ask the healthy, uh, the, the um, M maternal health uh, branch we just went through reorganization. MHB staff who are here, please stand. Most of them are uh, in the second row. Um, we also have staff from our Office of Policy if you, and, and others. If you'd stand as well, these are the people who defend your budget to Congress. So um, make sure, look at them, make sure you are very, very nice to them. Um, during the course of the, the conference. So Kim, as you have met on many occasions, is uh, leading that branch and she's doing a remarkable job. Um, it is extraordinary the number of projects that this woman juggles on every single day. She uh, comes in um, every day and sustains throughout most of the day this very pleasant mood and smile. <laughs> And um, we work very, very closely together to try to make sure that we make our awards by the end of the fiscal year and we don't leave any money on the table. So um, let me just give you a quick um, rundown of the programs that we have right now. I'm not going to go into budget details or anything like that. Almost all of these programs are in the process of either being recompeted right now or will be competed in the next year. And so we have had a tremendous amount of interface with our grants office. Um, some of our new staff are getting a blessing by fire in uh, grants operations and grants management. And um, I'd just like to rattle these off for you so that you're familiar with some of the things that we're working on if you're not already. And so that you can link and collaborate with these programs because we are encouraging that our programs um, work across their various missions to address the common purpose of preventing maternal morbidity and mortality. So as um, most of you are aware of, as recipients of the MHI program, um, that has grown tremendously. That is um, our largest program on the maternal health side. And the MHLIC, Technical Assistance and Support Cooperative Agreement, is um, the support for that and has just been doing a remarkable job, not just for the grantees, but for anyone in the country who's interested in working on maternal health, maternal morbidity, and mortality. Um, and they also receive funds from a variety of other sources, including the CDC um, to collaborate um, across the various activities. We do see part of our mission being to collaborate. Many of you as grantees have said, you're telling us to work with our partners. Why aren't you working with our par your partners? And we are trying very much to do that. 
Um, we also have our Integrated Maternal Health Services grant, which is a new grant portfolio that's going out. And this is a, uh, a model program where it's a demonstration testing whether or not there are interventions that can be done in the healthcare system um, and incentives to promote, and I'm seeing people pointing at these lovely slides here. Um, we uh, have the IMHS program, which is um, designed to be a demonstration to see what we can do to improve the healthcare system, and those new awards will be made between now and September. Um, we have our MMRDB program, which is our maternal uh, morbidity and mortality, our maternal depression program, which is being changed to include substance abuse, the title this year in the competition. Um, I do want to point out that um, we are seeing increasingly that the um, one of the leading causes of maternal death in the perinatal period in the first year after delivery uh, is related to maternal health and suicide, uh, um, mental health and suicide. And so this has been a key issue and concern for the administration and for Congress, and you can see new funding going into that area, which also relates to the hotline um, that Laura had mentioned during her talks. And we have a small program that we are going to be recompeting in the next year for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is doing some regional testing. Um, in particular, some of the sites are looking at American Indian and Native Alaskan sites, mostly American Indian sites, um, looking at um, strategies using a... Um, uh, a rural model to see whether or not we can um, make, make an impact there. Um, finally, we have a couple other programs that I wanted to mention, our AIM program, which has uh, received a tremendous amount of notoriety, and we, as that program has matured, have taken a different approach to the funding of that. We know that many states, and many of you may be involved with the states that have been uh, implementing AIM, that the federal government hasn't been giving much in the way of resources to the states to do that work and to the hospital systems who are uh, implementing the bundles and collecting the data. And so we are ponying up some resources uh, this year to uh, make funds available to support those endeavors. Um, and then last of all is our uh, Women's Preventive Services Initiative, the WIPSI program, which is um, the program that defines the preventive services that um, all women should be receiving, whether covered or not covered by insurance. But if you have insurance, then your insurance is required to cover it. It's mandated to provide those preventive services, and it's mandated to provide those services at no cost sharing to the woman. So we are very proud of the, um, the, the uh, menu of services that we have to offer. Um, that we're investing our resources in. We're trying to coordinate and use them as be best as possible. And we would encourage you to go to our website and link with those programs and explore how they may help you in developing the innovations um, that you're intending to work on through your program. The last thing I want to do is just encourage you to think innovatively about the work that you do. Um, we know that the vast majority of maternal morbidity and mortality is not the consequence of being in the hospital and during the delivery, but 60% of the deaths, um, which are preventable, um, uh, is, is the number that are preventable, and I believe it's around 60% or two-thirds that are, uh, occur outside of the hospital setting. And so those are factors that are related to policies, that are related to um, social constructs that we are trying to address and change. Um, they're related to economics, they're related to transportation and other social determinants of health, and that's where your programs are directly impactful on the health and well-being of women. So I want to thank you all for being here. I encourage you to uh, meet with others and do good work, and I want to turn it over to the woman who generally tells me what my job is for the day, Kimberly Sherman. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Thank you for the team that's here. And I am just so honored to see so many faces, all of you, every single one of us is working to address maternal health and to just bring joy back into this topic. I know it can be very, very difficult when we're looking at mortality data daily, when you're thinking about what's happening in your state, your counties, all the way down to the mom and baby that we are just trying to support and wrap our hands around. So with that, I just say thank you for taking space away from your job, your families to be here to learn. Um, know that the federal staff that are here, so the HRSA staff and also our CDC colleagues, please raise your hands because they're here as well, um, are here to support you in this work. Um, we, we truly believe that we are partners. We want to hear from you. We want you to help us get this right. Um, so feel free to 
to connect with all of the team. Um, if you're able to do that in person or via email, our email box is wellwomancare at hersa.gov. Um, we are solely responsible for getting these funds out and we need to hear your voice so that we're doing that correctly. Um, so, so, so just to ask, please connect with our teams while we're here. Let's openly communicate, share, and bring joy into this space. And then secondly, this is about innovation. This is about sharing. So I encourage you to meet one person today, share who you are and what you bring to the maternal health space. I had the pleasure of meeting Liz in the elevator. She got me all the way here, this beautiful floor. She works at UNC and we connected. And so we need to, we need the power to do more of that. So um, in whatever way you feel comfortable, please connect and share because we all bring something to this space, to our own communities and to this work. And again, just thank you for stepping away from your other duties and your families um, to be here. So um, cheers to a great two days and I'll turn it back over to Allison. <laughs> Do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So sorry, guys. We're going to borrow a little bit of time from your break, if you don't mind. Um, I guess we're forcing it on you, so thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it in advance. Um, well, um, we just want to take this one minute uh, because we had this idea that we, spe specifically for the symposium, that we really wanted to um, uplift and also just infuse a sense of joy and thriving because our work is sometimes a little bit heavy. <laughs> and to start off with that tone, we want to recognize somebody who embodies um, uplifting, joy, and thriving, who really infuses those, those things into her team members, um, into every single person she meets. And, you know, maternal health and women's health, a lot of times we get caught up in the numbers, the data, we're like, okay, maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity, we're looking at the numbers, you know, but we forget the people. We forget sometimes, like, when we're doing this work, I mean, we're all in this for the people, that's why we started in this work, right? But we, we get so caught up in the numbers and the reporting, and because we have to use the numbers to tell our story and to help people in Congress to give us more money, and, you know, it, it's, it, all, it all matters, but the people that are tied to the numbers is really what is really why we're here, why we're doing this work. And we want to acknowledge Kimberly Sherman as a person who is always striving to remember the people and not just the people we're serving in our programs, but the people who she works with, works for, her family, every single person. And um, we're gonna tell you a little bit more about why we're giving her this award. <laughs> Kimberly is honestly just the best boss you could ask for. She's a beacon of empowerment and compassion whose mission is to uplift and support other women in their journeys. With an unwavering belief in the power of unity and collaboration, Kim dedicates herself to creating a nurturing space where women can flourish and succeed. Whether it's providing mentorship, fostering networks of like-minded individuals, or simply lending a listening ear, she actively seeks out opportunities to champion the dreams and aspirations of her fellow women. Her boundless encouragement and genuine empathy not only inspire others to embrace their true potential, but also foster an environment where every woman can confidently pursue her passions and thrive. Kim's dedication to uplifting others serves as a guiding light, illuminating a path to a brighter and more inclusive future for women everywhere. And so on behalf of our team, Kimberly, we'd like to honor you with the Guiding Light Award.